Give God his praise. Yes, yes, sir. Right. Yes. Because he's worthy of it all. Worthy of it all. The saying goes, God is good. And all the time. Yes, and I've learned that God is better than good. When you really think about God, we really don't have the adequate vocabulary to describe how good God is to us. And so God understands our limited nature and he accepts the word good because that's all we got. <laughs> Legacy part, part number, part number two. If you journey back to John 11 last week, uh, we learned two valuable philosophies in regard to legacy. Legacy, we discovered uh, that it's a journey. Uh, the end result and success uh, of legacy. Everybody wants to get to that, that high point, get to the mountain where, hey, I'm remembered. People know who I am. Uh, look at the trail that I've blazed. And yes, that's the end result, right? Uh, but legacy, leaving that mark, making a lasting impression, uh, that is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that you have to work at. You have to, to strive for, right? And so when we talk about Lazarus, uh, in order to get the end result of Christ saying, Lazarus, come forth, we, we noted that Jesus had to allow him to die. Right. We talk about legacy. Legacy is not always a, a, a good experience. It's not always beneficial. Sometimes in order to win the war, you're going to have to lose some battles. God is going to allow some things to occur in your life. God will allow tragedy to strike. And yes, it may hurt, but as the saying goes, weeping may endure for a night, but what? Joy comes in the morning. Somebody say amen when you can. And so we understand that legacy is a journey of not just highs, but they're also lows. I've learned to appreciate God both not just when I'm on the mountain, but I've learned to further appreciate God in the valley because it's God, he's the one that's carrying me. It's God, he's the one that's lifting me when I fall down. It's God that is pushing me forward when I want to wave the white flag and say, you know what, I quit. But it's through the journey that you learn to appreciate God, not just on the mountain, but you better appreciate him in the valley. Somebody say amen when you can. Amen. And so we, we understood not only is legacy, according to John 11, not only was it a journey, we also said that legacy cultivates jubilee. If you understand Jubilee again, that was a period in Israel's history where if there was a loss, if, they, uh, uh, if something was lost, if something was, if they were in debt to society, those debts, those losses were forgiven and they were restored. And so in life, when you're uh, providing and trying to lead that legacy in the name of God, yes, you may go through some losses, but your gains will overrule your losses. You don't believe me? Look at the narrative of Job. Job, uh, his life, his legacy was a journey. We know the end result that he was blessed uh, uh, beyond measure, uh, but he had to lose some things. But in order for him to experience jubilee, in order for him to experience restoration, that means that you have to go through periods of being torn down. Amen? Right. And so Job lost it all only to get it all back and then some. And that's just how our good God works. God will allow you to lose some things. God will allow tragedy to strike only to turn around and give you things that you never thought possible. In other words, what the text is showing us, that prayer that you prayed, God will make sure that that prayer was not in vain. Uh, that, that, that service and sacrifice that you made, God will make sure that that sacrifice was not made in vain. Vain. When you plant a seed in the name of God, God will make sure that over time that seed will produce good fruit. Y'all still with me? Amen. So that was just last week. I ain't even got in today. All right? I'm just catching us up to speed. Getting to Luke 2, the apostle here, uh, in conjunction with what we saw in John 11, he offers a, another perspective and set of philosophies that are designed to impact us as well. Y'all with me? Right. And so there's two things, a number of things that we can talk about in this text, uh, but there's two things that the Spirit put in my heart to point out to us. And the first thing that we see, according to verse 41 through 43 of the text, we see legacy's involvement. Somebody say involvement. 
Yeah, yeah, legacies involvement. If you're here and you're with us online, type in that word, involvement. Right here in the text in verse 41, the Bible says there, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the days as they returned, it says the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Is that, is that in your Bibles? Now, again, the Feast of the Passover, uh, when you look in this text, it, we know it was an important Jewish festival commemorating the Passover. You, we know the Passover very well. If you go back into Exodus, that was the final and tenth plague uh, that God brought on the Egyptians, right? And so it was the death of the firstborn. Now, we know the instructions well, uh, that they were given to God's people. They were commanded to take um, a, a, a unspotted, a, a blemishless lamb, kill it, and spread that blood on the threshold or the doorpost. Y'all still with me? Now, and when that deaf angel came, uh, only if the death angel saw the blood, but saw the blood on the doorpost, the death angel would pass over. And so from that point on, when Israel uh, got to be better established, when they became a prominent people and had organization and structure and could get back to their normal religious practices, uh, this was a Jewish feast designed to remember what happened during their captivity. You all with me? And that makes sense. Why? Because faith is about remembrance. So in order for them to never forget what God did, they had this festival. Now, there were several festivals and Jewish feasts that existed during this time, but in the Jewish culture, this was probably the most important. Y'all still with me? I'll get to where you want to be in a minute. Trust me, I will. Now, again, we said legacy is built over time, right? It's a journey. We see this same case right here in Luke chapter number two. Now, when you look at the grand scheme of the life and ministry of Christ, we know that the public ministry of Jesus did not begin until he was about 30 years old, right? And so that was about a three, three and a half year period, somewhere in between there, that he dwelt in among the public, dwelt amongst the people, he preached to them, he taught them, performed miracles, so on and so on, right? Now, that's the end result, but understand that, again, legacy is a journey, and what Luke 2 is suggesting to us, that the legacy of Christ didn't start when he was 30. Right. His legacy started when he was 12 years old. Right. Preacher, what are you getting at? Uh, understand that uh, uh, the uh, uh, that public ministry, when you talk about being a, a, a legacy, being a trailblazer as a body of people, we should not entertain the idea that legacy is crippled or limited by age. Yes, sir. All right. All right. Lord have mercy. Uh, if, you, if you go into the days of, uh, of the Civil Rights Movement and the Little Rock Nine, those girls that migrated and integrated the uh, Little Rock School, uh, they were leaving a legacy. All right. All right. Hey. Nine years old. Yeah. And we still remember and talk about them. Yeah. Emma Till, God rest his soul. A, 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 a preteen boy, his life was a legacy and, and affected great change. Yes, wow, he was brutally murdered, but his life left a legacy for people to follow. Right. And so just like the Little Rock Nine, just like Emma Till, Jesus wasn't an adult. He was 12 years old, still living with mom and daddy, still grew up under their tutelage and expectation, but he still, he didn't start his legacy. They didn't say, wait until he's older, but he started at 12. And we have to be a body of people that allow room for our youth to leave their mark on us. We cannot be the kind of church that says, well, wait till you're 16 or wait till you're an adult at 18. Wait till you go to college, come back with some experience. I'm here to tell you, with this generation, it's too late by then. They are already gone. And so we have to teach them and show them that, hey, you are important, not just as an adult, but you have value in you right now. That's why we're trying to get our Bible school off the ground. Why? Because we want to show them that God has value in them right now. All right. And we must instill that in them. Y'all right? 
And so Jesus, uh, we understand that impact and legacy requires involvement. Somebody say involvement. It says now in verse 43, now when they had finished the days, as they returned, watch this now, it says in verse 43, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother did not know it. Y'all see that there? Now, what we learn from a 12-year-old is that legacy requires involvement. When you talk about legacy, and the challenge is uh, why many of us are, are struggling or why legacy is difficult, because when you are trying to leave a legacy, legacy is a, not about the individual, but it's about the people that are going to follow the individual. Legacy is not only about impacting the individual, impacting you personally, but legacy is about asking the question with my life and the choices that I make and the actions that I am committing, how will this affect somebody else? And that's why many of us uh, I can't leave a legacy because we're selfish. You can't leave a mark. You can't make an impression on somebody else if all you do is think about yourself. Well, what am I getting out of the deal? Will people or somebody, are they going to sing my praises? All right. All right now. And so legacy requires involvement. Many of us want to make an impression on people, but never want to be around people. Well, you can't build a legacy by staying to yourself. Amen. I mean, how impactful would Christ be, number one, if he never came to earth? Well. Christ understood, and it's a lesson for us, if we are going to make an impression on people, we can't cozy up within ourselves. We have to get out amongst the people. Lord have mercy. Christ said, I'm going to leave a legacy by being involved. We see it all the time in Scripture. We referenced him feeding the 5,000 last week, right? After he taught them, the disciples said, hey, send them away. Christ said, no, you give them something to eat. Christ was involved not just in their spiritual well-being, but he was concerned about their physical well-being as well. And so you got to be involved. Uh, Christ, uh, when he was traveling in the public ministry, and you have the blind men there, and uh, they were sitting alongside the road, and they were crying out, you know, Master, help me, save me. And the people told, basically told them, hey, shut up, he don't have time for you. But Christ stopped from his journey, uh, uh, took time away from his busy schedule to pause and deal with those that were affected and afflicted. Again, he understood that if I'm going to make an impact, I have to show concern and I have to be genuine in how I involve myself in their lives. In other words, bringing that relevant to even the church as a whole. Uh, we talk about making a legacy in the community. We can't make our impression on them if all we want to do is tell them, hey, we're not going to go to you, but if you'll just come to the church, that's where blessings come from. Yes, we know that blessings indeed come in God's house where we have designated ourselves to gather. We're blessed right now, but God intends for the blessings not to remain in the four walls of the sanctuary, the temple, and the synagogue. Christ is showing us that if you really want to affect change, you have to not only come into the house, but you have to at some point leave the house. Go and dwell and fellowship with those who are struggling. Right. Y'all right? Yeah. I know we shouted last week, but ain't, you know, we ain't doing it this week. Well, right we got to switch it up every now and again. <laughs> I also understand in a very practical way, Jesus at 12 years old, lingering behind, it was not practical. It was actually radical and extremely dangerous for a 12-year-old to stay behind with other people, right? The text says that they, his parents assumed that when they didn't see him, that they assumed him to be in the company. Now, this was common 
in Jewish culture because they traveled in droves and groups. And so if a parent in their culture, if they did not see their child, it was the a correct assumption to assume that my child is somewhere in this caravan of people. And that's why they didn't panic, right? But because he was not there, it's very dangerous. What do we see in Luke 10? Parable of the Good Samaritan. A man traveling by himself fell amongst these. So it's very dangerous. The roads that people traveled to get to the mother city of Jerusalem, they were not uh, evenly paved. They were not well lit. I mean, you go travel in Tulsa, certain places at night, we ain't got no lights nowhere, all right? Same concept with Jerusalem. Getting to the mother city, it was not an easy journey, right? And so it was dangerous, it, number one, for an adult. But Jesus is 12. And so it wasn't practical, it wasn't safe, it was dangerous. But Christ showed us at 12, I'm not so much concerned about my life, but it's what can I gather from being amongst other people. When you talk about making a legacy, it requires sacrifice. Yes, we know there's a balance between my personal safety. When you talk about getting out there with the people, it's going to be dangerous. It's going to be some hardship. I'll be real with you. When you look at the average church, uh, primarily African American, our church is not in the best part of town. It's in the hood. And we're not called to just go out and get the people that look like us, that we know, um, that are educated, that sometimes you got to go out there and talk to those gang members. Yeah. You got to get there and talk to those who are on the streets. Talk to the people that, that have nothing. Why? Because they deserve to hear from God too. That makes sense? And so it, it, legacy is, it's not going to always be safe. It's not going to always be practical. It will not always make sense. Sometimes you have to get out there in danger. And that's when you can have a testimony like David. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, he said, what? Well, I'm not going to fear because I know God's with me. Yes. Right? And, and, and so you have to learn that when David's life, David was on the run. David, his life was always at stake, but he remained impactful. He remained sacrificial. You'll find that David, uh, yes, while he was anointed to be king at 16, David actually became king when he was in the cave of Adullam. Well. In danger, fleeing for his life, around all those who were in debt to King Saul, all those who owed him, all those who had uh, a bounty on their head, David dwells among the people that were not uh, uh, allowed in the temple. Well, Let's might get the other way home, that's all right. And so legacy is about being involved, not just with the people that you know. <laughs> legacy is most felt when you bless people that you don't know. Amen. People Amen. that look dangerous. Well. People that have a bad reputation. How is that important? Because the rest of the world views them as such. But when a child of God can go to them in peace, no assumption, no preconceived notion about them, no judgment, no, no notion, and just go to them and show that they love them and care about them, you'll never know what your, just your mere presence can mean to them. They'll say, nobody comes out here with us. Nobody shows that they care, but what about you encourage you to come out and be with me and people like me? Well, and that's when you share with them, God sent you. Amen. And God has sent me to share with you good news. Is that all right? And so understand that Jesus in Luke 2, and I love this when I was looking at this, Jesus in Luke 2 was not a man of the people. <laughs> he was a boy of the people. Well, yeah. well, right. Wasn't an adult, wasn't fully mature. But even at 12, he knew how to be involved. Yeah. Understand our, our children, they're smart. They're more, they're high, they're more intelligent than we give them credit for. 
Teach them community service. Teach them involvement. Teach them how uh, to get out there and affect change and be a blessing to those who are less fortunate than them. Because then when they grow up, they'll understand, you know what? They'll appreciate what, you, what they have. They'll appreciate the blessings and things and the legacy that you're trying to leave for them. Is that all right? And so see, number one, that legacy is about involvement. Amen? Say involvement again. And the next one, you get to verse 46 in the text, we see that legacy is about inspiration, right? So look at the text in verse 46. The Bible says there, Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Verse 47, And all who heard them were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said to him, Son, why had you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Verse 49, and he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Is that in your Bibles? As we alluded to earlier, cultivating legacy at the age of 12 was risky. It was uncomfortable, not only for Christ, but more so for the loved ones and supporters of Jesus. Amid the danger, radical nature, and risk, there's obviously a motivation involved. Um, after three days, I mean, think about it, he's gone for three days. Not just lost for a moment, and okay, we found him, all right, three days. I mean, at that point, you can imagine how, how, how anxious that Mary and Joseph were. You can imagine they probably sent out a search party to go and find them. I mean, imagine Mary. Uh, I am the mother of God's son, and I lost him. Well. Imagine Joseph. I've been charged to lead this boy that ain't even mine, and I lost him. And so imagine how scared and terrified they were, not just of losing their boy, but of maybe possibly the spiritual implications of losing their son. Y'all stay with me? And so now after they found him, yes, uh, Mary, while she was a virgin, spiritually impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God, yes, Joseph had now fully embrace being a father to the Son of God, you can see them now after three days, that really wasn't a concern for them. Preacher, how do you know that? Because when they got to him after three days, they talked to him like our parents would talk to us. Y'all don't believe me, right there in the text. What did he say? Son, why have you done this to us? He said, look, your father, and I have sought you anxiously. I mean, think about it practically. Son, we, we couldn't even eat for three days. We couldn't find you. Couldn't sleep. We were so concerned. We, we called your family, called your cousins, called Poo Poo Ray Ray and them. They said they ain't seen you. Yeah. And so now that we finally found you, son, why did you do this to us? All we have done was try to raise you as best as we could, and you run off and leave. But look at his response. Mary expressed concern on behalf of Jesus' earthly parents. But Jesus, in contrast, responded with concern for his spiritual parents. Mary, concerned and anxious, could only speak from a carnal perspective. Yes, she understood. I mean, yes, she saw the vision. She uh, heard the voice of the angel saying that, you know, you've been impregnated by the Spirit of God. She understood that. But when she lost her boy, she could only speak in a carnal perspective. And so she said, we're where we were worried about you. And Jesus in contrast, responded not from an earthly perspective, but he responded with a spiritual perspective. What did he say? He asked them two questions. Number one, why did you look for me? Now, I'm a parent now, so I can fully understand their concern. 
Jesus, boy, what do you mean, why do we look for you? You're, my, you're our child. Well, come on now. But he asked him, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Let him mercy. When you look at the context, the danger, uh, the radical uh, mindset that a 12-year-old would have to have, stay behind. You say, what's your inspiration? All the other 12-year-old boys are with their parents. Jesus, you in the temple. What's wrong with you? Don't you want to just be a kid? And so you have to ask, what was his inspiration? Mm. What caused him to, to leave the toys and the childish games asunder to now be about legacy? I mean, Jesus, you're only 12. You got your whole life yeah. to leave a legacy. But what they didn't know, that he's 12, and about 21 years later, he's going to be gone. Right, right, right. Boy, Jesus, Jesus, what inspired you? He didn't just ask them, why did you seek me? But he further confused them with the second question when he asked, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, if I'm Joseph, boy, I am your father. Last time I checked, our business is carpentry. So, so uh, your father's business is right here along my side. And so y'all see Mary and Joseph, their perspective, right? And so you can imagine Christ had to uh, further demonstrate and show them what they meant. Now, now, now after they found him, now I also not understand after they found him, but I also understand where they found him didn't find him out there in the streets, didn't find him turning up with everybody else. Well, the text says that they found him in the temple well, all right. with the church leaders, with the church folk, in Bible study, talking with them, asking them, in other words, Christ was Curious, he was uh, uh, he was curious about spiritual matters. He was concerned about not only his life, but what the current status was, what the current theology and philosophy was concerning the church. Now, what we have to understand also with legacy, legacy is not just about involvement with the community, but it's also about involvement with the church. And what has happened, what COVID has done to us, COVID has made us comfortable with being more involved out there in the world than being involved in the church. It's made us comfortable with uh, uh, being at home. And I'm not talking about the people at home that have legitimate concerns, but I'm talking to the folk that are at home knowing that tomorrow they've got to punch that clock. And it's made us comfortable with being at the house, being amongst our friends, being amongst the world. When Christ is saying, if you want to leave a legacy, you have to be involved, not just in the world, but you have to be involved in the church. Yeah, yeah, all of us want the blessings of God. God, I want you to bless me, but you don't want to come in this house and bless him. Uh, God, I want you to honor me, but you don't want to come in here and honor God. God, I want you to make my crooked path straight, but you never want to open God's word and study it. And so everybody wants the end result. We want the prosperity. We want the spiritual blessings that God has to offer, but we don't want to put in the work. Christ showed us not just at 30 and 33, but he showed us at 12 years old that leaving a legacy again, it starts with God and the people of God. Make this thing live even more so. Christ didn't need anybody to teach him. But he humbled himself 
under the very ones that he created. Christ sat there and he let them teach him. Christ sat there and asked them questions that he already knew the answers to. So what was Christ doing? Christ was demonstrating, Christ was showing us that involvement in the community is important, but involvement in the spiritual community of God is critical to the legacy that God has destined for you and I to leave. Christ, what will, again, Christ, what was your inspiration? Let me tell him, I gotta be about my, my father's business. And the thing is, if you follow the life of Christ, and this is where you get your shout, if you, somebody, gear up, you're about to shout right now, I'm gonna tell you. What inspired Christ at 12 was the same thing that inspired him through his whole life. Right. Let me tell you, right. son, why did you, why'd you do this to us? Christ said, I'm only doing what my father has sent me to do. Right. Christ said, did you not know that I must be about my father's, in other words, Christ was at twice 12 years old talking to Mama Mary and Daddy Joseph. Don't forget how I got here. Well, all right, all right. All right. Yes, sir. Y'all love each other, but y'all didn't love each other to get me here. Well. Now, if you're an adult, I'm trying to keep, we got kids here, okay? Christ saying y'all didn't love each other to produce me. Christ was subtly reminding them, you know why I'm here. Well, right? Yeah. All right? All right. And so the question of inspiration is bigger than Jesus at 12. Say, so Jesus, what, what, what inspired you to leave your parents and, and dwell in the temple with the people? It was his father's business. Christ, what inspired you to go and get, allow John the Baptist to baptize you? It was being about his father's business. Lord, what inspired you to turn that water into wine so that people may believe it was not of his own volition, but it was his father's business? Christ, what led you to have compassion on the people and looking at them as if they were sheep without a shepherd? It was Christ being about his fathers, y'all ain't hearing me this morning. Christ, what was it that when the people were 5,000 deep, not including women and children, what was it about you that inspired you to feed them when they had money to go and buy food for themselves? It was Christ being about his fathers. Y'all yeah. hear what I'm saying? Christ, what was it that let them, uh, you allowed them to beat you within an inch of your life? It was being about his father's business. I'm here to tell you when they scourged him and crucified him and when Christ, what was it that when you were on Pilate, you were on the judgment seat knowing that everybody one day will have to stand before you? It was Christ being about what his father's business. Christ, yeah. You didn't have to do, you didn't have to die for us. What allowed them, allowed you to put the crown of thorns on your head? What inspired you to let them beat you, let them curse you, let them embarrass you? Being about his father's business. Christ, you could have called legions of angels to come and save you and protect you and wipe out all of your enemies. What inspired you to stay there? What inspired you to have a spirit of forgiveness? What inspired you to have no deceit to be found in your mouth? I'm here to tell you today that the same inspiration that Christ had at 12, it was the same inspiration that he had at 33. Yes, sir. All right. Christ, you didn't have to, to die. What inspired you? being about his fathers. But Christ, you didn't have to stay in that tomb for any amount of time. Christ, we saw how you resurrected Lazarus. Christ, what kept you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was Christ being about his father's business. And that matters with us. Listen, 
There's some things and sacrifices that you and I are going to have to make, not for the glory of self, but solely for the employment of being about not our earthly father or mother, but being about our heavenly father's Is that all right? I got happy when, when I saw that. Because if Christ can be inspired at 12, surely I ought to be inspired at 34. Christ inspired at 12, you ought to be inspired at your age wherever you are. You ought to find inspiration at any point in your life. Why? Because you're God's child. Christ was born to die. And to live again. You and I were born not just once, but we're also born again to die. Not necessarily just physically, but we're born to die spiritually. And when you die physically, the inspiration of the legacy that Christ left, Christ showed us that when you die in the Lord, God's got a place for you not made with hands. Amen. When you die in the Lord, you hear God's voice say, well done. When you're about his business and you die for his cause, it may be troublesome, but when you wake up in that great getting up morning, it's going to all be worth it. Uh, yes, you're going to have to make some sacrifice. I'm going to tell you, being a Christian, leaving this godly spirit-filled legacy, it's not easy. All right. Christ, the older he got, all he did was further confuse his mother. Mm. Wedding at Cana. <laughs> I'll tell you this, I'll let you go. Wedding at Cana, right? Had a wedding there. Had some good wine. Ran out. Mother came to him. Son, we had a wine. Can you do something? Jesus, why did you come to me? Imagine, Mary, aren't, aren't you the father, son? Right? And so... The older he got, Christ grew more distant spiritually from his mother. Why? Because she was just a vessel that God used to bring him here. Now, that's not to say that Jesus didn't love her. We know he did because according to John's gospel, one of his final sayings while he's up on the cross was he made sure that even though he was dying, he made sure that his mother was taken care of. Looked at John and said, son, behold your mother. Looked at his mother and said, mother, behold your son. Christ did not finish his God-given business until he made sure that his mama was taken care of. All right. All right? So I'm not here saying, child, as you grow up, be disrespectful. That's not what I'm saying. All right. But what I am saying is, all of us get to a point to where the business of God has to be priority over the flesh. And there will be times in your life when even mama and daddy won't understand why you do what you do. Trust me. I love my parents. Love my mama, love my daddy. Trust me, they didn't always understand why I did what I did. Case in point, I'll be real, I'll let you go. After Southwestern, the majority of the church wanted me to come home immediately. What did I tell y'all? No. I ain't coming, stop asking me. There were two reasons why I said that. One, selfishly, I didn't want to come back home. Just being honest with you. But spiritually, I understood even in college and in high school what Virgin Street needed. Yeah. All right. Virgin Street, in order to move forward, does not just need a preacher. With the church and society growing, we need a man of God, but we also need administration. And in order, if I'm supposed to come back home, and this is back in my mind, if I'm supposed to be the one to come home, I can't do straight after college. So I stayed in Texas. Why? Because I was at a church with elders, right. with deacons. I was sitting in leadership meetings. I learned how to appoint elders. I learned how to interview deacons. I learned how to deal with arbitration. I didn't learn that stuff in college. I learned it out there in the field, working with the congregation that was showing me the things that Virgin Street would need in the future. 
And so, yeah, I was telling you no. Some of it was selfish. But I understood that if I'm going to come back home, I'm going to need more experience. All right. That's it. That's it. That's it. Family didn't understand it. Ryan, come home. Stop asking me. Came back home. What happened? Uh, people, long-standing members in the church left. Why? Because they only saw me as a boy. Right. What they didn't understand was how God was developing me and shaping me in college. Not understanding that in college, I managed all of the ministerial students as the chapel coordinator. Led our student devotions. Why? Wow. God was showing me how to manage people. All right. All right. And what you'll find that when you're about God's business, everybody won't understand. Even if you try to explain it, they won't understand. Why? Because that's not their vision. That's not the mission that God has given to them. And so be okay with staying with God, even if it causes a little separation. All right. All right. Because God had to create separation now that I can come back home. All right. So now we're like Moses, I had to leave. Selfish reasons. Like Moses, scared. I mean, leading the church ain't easy. I love y'all, but y'all who? And so God had to get me ready to deal with the people that I love and deal with them in a way that it's not just our familial ties, but also lead us spiritually. Because there's going to be some times that when myself or anybody step out of line, God is holding me accountable for how I lead. And so I, I can't talk to you as your nephew. I got to talk to you as God's man, as ambassador. I can't talk to you as your brother, as your cousin. Because that's not the mission. God didn't send me back home to be a family member. God sent me back home as a minister destined to pastor this church. Is that all right? And what I also learned in college, when you learn to wait on stuff, it's better. Well, I'm, trust me when I'm telling you, if y'all would have got Ryan straight after college, I, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Would have quit a long time ago. And so legacy is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It may cause some separation, but God sometimes has to create separation to better bring us back, back together. Look at the prodigal son. He needed that separation because he, he didn't really appreciate all that his father was doing. So God allowed him to get out there, leave the house, mess up royally, waste all his goods with prodigal living, only to find out, you know what? My daddy wasn't so bad. Sometimes you got to leave the house to, you know what? Sometimes you have to leave the house to better appreciate the house. Yeah. I wish I can go back to being 12 when mama was cooking and daddy had everything. I didn't have to like, worry about what's in the refrigerator. I knew when I opened it, food was there. Now I open the refrigerator, I got to go and get it. Well, come on now. I wish. I wish. I wish I could go and, and back into my house and turn the light on knowing that I ain't paid the bill. Just, and the bills keep coming. I'm sick of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Tell the truth, brother. <laughs> Some of y'all identify. <laughs> come on, come on, come to your feet. Come on, come on. Legacy's hard, requires sacrifice. But when you're doing it for God and the right reasons, God will make it worth your while. God will make sure that that sacrifice is never in vain. God will make sure that that investment that you've made in God and his people, in your family, your loved ones, it always produces good fruit. Amen. Let's enjoy this. Maybe you're here as a child of God, and you're trying to fulfill the legacy that God has destined for you, and you're struggling with it. It happens. It's hard. I struggle with it. Warring between staying where I was, coming home, knowing that God, I know this is where you want me to go, but I'm not too comfortable. And so it's a struggle sometimes, and you have to pray about it and pray about it some more. Y'all don't know the conversations that I had with my leadership there in Texas. Like, y'all, look, I love y'all, but I feel like God is sending me somewhere else. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life because I love them there. 
but I had to love God more, and I also loved you all. So it was hard. God will put you in situations that would divide, divide us. Only to bring us back together. So maybe you're struggling with that the legacy that God has for you. This is time for prayer. This is time for encouragement. Maybe not a member of the body of Christ. Understand that outside of God's family, you have no legacy. I mean, you're doing stuff in the world. That's cool. I mean, it's great, you know, legacy for it. When, when you pass away and the people of this earth remember you, but what good is your legacy if God doesn't remember you? All right. We're living life to leave a legacy to meet the approval, not of man, but of God. Yeah. Eternity lets us know if we did the job that God sent us to do. And we're known, that legacy is known, if it's impactful, by two responses. One response, well done. The other response, depart from me. You worker of iniquity, I never. It's not that you weren't working. God is saying you were working, but you weren't working for me. Well. And so I don't know about you, but I want to hear the former. Well done. Thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful not over everything, but a few things. Now I'll make you ruler over me. See, God, God is saying, just do, a, just do a few. Just do what you can. Give, just give me your best. Give me that, and I'll make an umbrella into heaven. We don't deserve heaven. But God is saying, if you just do your best down here, I'll give you something that your mind can't even fathom. And so what, what we're saying here is the reward always outweighs the sacrifice, right? And so, say, so well, preacher, how do I get into my legacy? It happens through the act of baptism. That is an act of faith. Understanding that you're coming to God just as you are, not trying to cover, conceal, or hide anything, but you're coming clean to God just as you are. Understanding that God loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. Come to him as a sinner, broken, disappointed, heartbroken, hurt it, sinful. God takes that, takes that faith. You agree and say, okay, I'm coming as I am, but I know that I can't be the same. Have a repenting spirit. Understand that I'm going to do my best to live for God for the rest of my life. Put him on in baptism and put you in the family of God. Gives you access to all that he is and all that he has for you. What's your desire? You need prayer and encouragement? Come on. Uh, you need salvation? Come on, come on, come on now while we sing a song of invitation. Will you come?